Good morning, Wednesday morning, um, and it is time for your highly entertaining A push lecture. So we need to get finished with these notes because we have a test on Friday. We're reviewing for our uh, test tomorrow in class. We're going to play a review game um, and based on the operation game. I love this game. I played it a couple times last year with my kids and they really liked it and it seemed to help. So um, we'll do that as well. So we are on page three. We ended up yesterday with the uh, significance and the importance of the Declaration of Independence. And surely you understand the importance of it to the colonist. But most of all, you should understand the significance of that to the rest of the world, that we established ourselves as a country. And that means that we're able to seek out financial aid and have other countries help and support us against our fight against Britain. So that's really important. And again, if you're asked anything about the Declaration of Independence, that's usually what you're asked about is what it signified uh, financially to the colonist. The bottom of page three is my patriots and loyalists that for some reason in this chapter, I have had a hard time wrapping around in my head. I got so many times I got that confused. Um, we go by John Adams. Um, there's no real hard evidence to this. There's no numbers. There's no um, uh, data that we can look at. We just refer to John Adams' uh, uh, numbers because obviously he was there in the moment and he is our best uh, primary source that we have. A third were patriots, a third were loyalists, and a third is are neutral. What we do know is that this is true. Like Not everyone supported, and as we look on the next few pages, we'll see how that plays out. Um, loyalists, they're loyal to the crown. So the loyalists are Tories, uh, colonists for those who fought to uh, return to colonial rule, conservative, well-educated, fearful of mob rule. They're very wealthy. These groups of people are still going to hang around after we become a country because we're still going to be afraid of mob rule. That's always something that we're afraid of. Um, and older generation, on the top of page four, uh, included a lot of clergy, and that, again, will be important. Um, less uh, numerous in New England, which I hope that makes sense. Uh, they're, they'll be very ineffective. They won't gain any followers. Like, if you're not a loyalist to start, you're probably not going to turn to loyalist halfway through the war. So they're pretty much stagnant with their uh, support. Patriots, sometimes called Whigs. American rebels who fought both British soldiers and loyalists, most numerous in New England, and again, that should make sense, uh, constituted a minority movement. This is minorities. This is not, and I don't mean minorities and as in um, uh, genetic minorities, but I mean minorities and they are the small group. Um, more inept at gaining support for colonials, they were able to push people to their side. So that neutral one-third, more often than not, were influenced by these um, patriots and financing Robert Morris, who is going to put up almost his entire fortune and bankrupt himself to support um, the Revolutionary War. About 80,000 loyalists are going to flee. They're just going to leave, pick up, go back um, either to Britain or they'll head up to Canada. So the bottom of page four, we will look at several times at mistakes that the British made in this war. And honestly speaking about the, the American Revolution, the Americans did not win this war. Britain lost it. Uh, and they make very tragic mistakes for them, positive mistakes for us, um, in, uh, in about this war. And um, it is important to know that, that uh, this war was Britain's to lose. And they do that very well. And we'll see in several moments when their their uh, decisions greatly impact the outcome of the war and especially for the colonists in a positive light. So for whatever reason, and there is a reason if you want to really go into it, you can look it up and find out yourself. Britain changed its focus to the Mid-Atlantic States. So they switch their eye of Moldor from Boston and Massachusetts to New York probably because they felt like New York would have been an easier, they get a toe in New York and they could squeeze out Massachusetts. And, then, and that's, that, was, I, that was their goal, but that's not really what's going to happen. 
So we move into New York, and that's where this battle all begins uh, that takes on a whole different type of uh, strategy for both the British and uh, the Americans. Battle of Long Island, Army's gonna, uh, Washington's army is just going to escape from, on, uh, from Long Island. He gets his whole army out. That was the fear that, that uh, Washington's army would be entirely captured. It's really the only army that we have at this point. And Washington has to be very careful and very protective of this small, ever-growing army. Britain loses an opportunity to crush the, the again, could have crushed easily. He sneaks away in the night in the fog, moves off. Battle of Trenton. This is one of the few successes that we have in this time period. This is Washington crossing the Delaware. It's that famous uh, uh, painting of Washington standing at the front of a canoe going across the Delaware. And uh, it is uh, at Christmas and surprise the Hessians in their underwear, so to speak because they had had a rip a roar in time of a Christmas party with lots of eggnog and other types of spirits. And uh, they were fairly much sleeping it off. Uh, and Washington and his troops got fairly lucky in that um, uh, battle. Then we get the Battle of Princeton, where Washington will defeat a smaller force. Uh, British is a force to pull back. And Trenton and Princeton gamble by Washington to achieve quick victories, and that's what we needed. We need something really quick, something uh, to boost spirits, something to show the rest of the world that we could hang on and, and fight against uh, the British until we get to the Battle of Saratoga on the bottom of page four. And you can see Battle of Saratoga, the most important battle of the whole revolution, minus Yorktown, just because that's the winning, but of everything else the single most important battle of the entire revolution, which is fought early in 1777, is um, Battle of Saratoga. So the Battle of Saratoga, um, Britain sought to keep uh, capture New York and sever New England. Benedict Arnold, and again, this is a name that doesn't go down on the plus side of history, but he is the savior of the revolution in 1777. He is the most important um uh, general, he, I'm sorry, he is the most important um, officer. He uh, saves the revolution at this point, because if he had not won the Battle of Saratoga, surely things would have been different. Um, he uh, slows down the invasion. He cuts them off. He uh, engages in this big battle. And at the top of page five, again, Saratoga, one of the history's most decisive battles, not just in American history, not just in the Revolutionary War, but in the history of the world, because this is what allows the Americans to continue to fight and move forward. Had Benedict Arnold not been able to stave off uh, the British Army from getting into New York and cutting off New England, really different outcome. The second part of the Battle of Saratoga, because we win, now gives us leverage with the French. It now allows us to say to the French, hey, we really got something here. We think that we could probably win. We're standing toe to toe with these guys. And at the top of page five, I would put a giant box around this, made possible French aid, which ultimately ensured American independence. Without the aid from the French, there's no way that we win. No possible way that we win without the aid from the French. At this point, and we'll look in a couple other pages, all other British haters, which is virtually the entire continent of Europe, say, hey, this is the time to take down Britain in Europe. And so Spanish, Dutch, everybody's fighting England. And that's the side of this revolutionary war on our side that doesn't get told very often. Great Britain wasn't just fighting the colonists. They were fighting Spain and the Dutch and the French and anybody else that had a, uh, a, um, a grievance against Britain decided this is a great time to go to war with Great Britain. So that will be a major factor as we move forward um, in discussing the American Revolution. The other thing that's interesting and that I think a lot of people don't understand like about places like Valley Forge, armies didn't fight in the winter. No armies fought in the winter. Everybody kind of just went home and went to quarters. It was too cold and it didn't make sense to try to wage war when the um, elements were so horrible. So um, Washington hunkering down at Valley Forge was what armies had always done. It wasn't anything unusual. It wasn't anything special. It's just what they did. What made Valley Forge different and what made Valley Forge um, um, 
a uh, important part of our history is when they decided to hunker down, they didn't really have much supplies. They really didn't have much. Um, they didn't have enough food. They didn't have um, enough shelter. They didn't have boots, coats, blankets. And so that's what it makes Valley Forge kind of this um, um, iconic moment in American history that the men still stayed, especially that they didn't have enough food. Um, their, their families were back home without food. They weren't getting paid. Uh, it, it shows the um, um, beliefs that these men had in this revolution. Also, the second part what's there is Washington uses this time to really start to work on his uh, army and his troops into some kind of uh, professional training and gets a Prussian uh, uh, general, uh, Baron von Steuben, to help whip these men into shape so that they're ready. Second part of this time period is Benedict Arnold becomes a traitor. Benedict Arnold's not moving up like he thinks. After the Battle of Saratoga, he feels like he should be um, awarded um, um, a higher position in General Arm, uh, General Washington's army, and he's not. For whatever reason, uh, George Washington picks that. So Benedict Arnold also has a wife that's English. She also is behind him saying, you should be doing this. You should be getting this. And so at this point, he makes a decision that really changes the course of history and, of course, the rest of his life. He agrees to become a, a traitor for the British. Uh, he gets Washington to commit to giving him uh, West Point, uh, to hold West Point, at which he's going to turn it over um, to um, the British and um, thankfully, Washington comes uh, up and uh, finds the plot and destroys the plot. And then Benedict Arnold becomes the most famous traitor in U.S. history. He goes back to England. He dies there. He's done. In the middle of all this, so remember we're talking about these two paths that we go by. Oh, that's kind of like a Led Zeppelin song. Yes, there are two paths you can go by. But in the long run, it's still time to change the road to run. We got a legislative path and a fighting path. So we've been discussing the fighting path. There's still a whole bunch of people sitting back, working on that legislative path, understanding that in the process of this new country, we have to have some kind of guiding principles. And our first guiding principles on page five are the Articles of the Confederation. Gigantic box around this. The College Board loves to ask you about the Articles of the Confederation. One, again, because most people don't know anything about the Articles of the Confederation. Two, it's our very first Constitution. It's our first Constitution, and it does not work. It doesn't work. It is clearly, should be clear to most all students why it's not going to work, but it also should be clear why they chose to write it in the way that they did. So the Articles of the Confederation adopted in 1777. So a year after the Declaration of Independence, we are already adopting our first constitution. Um, set up by the Second Continental Congress to create a lasting government. We are already thinking we're winning, got to have a government. Doesn't go into effect until 1781 because it has to be ratified by all the colonies. And it is our first constitution. Um, it's the very first one. It will last for um, eight short, short years, and we'll see why. Um, and it gives Congress the power to conduct war. So obviously they had to give themselves that power because they were already doing it. Handle foreign relations, secure loans, and borrow money. So they could get money, borrow money, secure loans. What they could not do is more significant in what they could do. They could not regulate trade. They could conduct war, but they can't draft troops. That's kind of hard if you're going to have a war and you don't have troops. And then the most important one is they can't levy taxes. They cannot tax as a um, um, Congress they can't tax the, the colonists. What they had hoped is the colonists would tax and then the colonies would pay. That is not going to happen. And I hope you can see that is not going to happen. So that's the Articles of Confederation. We're going to leave that there because that just kind of stays there until we get into our next set of chapters and we figure out this thing is not going to work. Bottom of page five, giant important uh, history making event at the bottom, France becomes an ally of the US. Now, we have to think about this 
realistically, right? France doesn't become an ally of the U.S. because they support democracy and they support uh, uh, the colonists' fight for an oppressor because Spain was an oppressor. A Spain because France was an oppressor. France was not a democracy. In no way was it a democracy. It was the most absolutist nation in Europe. It had the most absolutist king at any point in time. So why? Because they hate the British. Pure and simple. How does the British? Uh, how do the French feel about the the revolution? And they're okay, but it gives them the opportunity to fight against Britain and perhaps when the U.S. fails, take back the colonies of the North, of North America. These colonies in North America are very, very valuable. They have so many resources that both England and France want. So at the bottom of page five, France eager to exact revenge, 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 revenge. This is all about revenge. It is about a 900 year hatred of Britain. It's not about supporting the United States at all. Um, secret supply to the Americans. They do it secretly because they know if, Fran if Britain finds out they're helping, they will focus the war back on France. That will be uh, inevitable. So um, Ben Franklin goes and gets a lot of money. And Ben Franklin is awesome when he goes to France. Ben Franklin from Philadelphia. Ben Franklin that had probably never been out in the wilderness, certainly never wore a coonskin cap in Philadelphia, parades around France as this backwoods kind of Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett person, and is really successful in his act because he has lots of mistresses, lots of them. They love Ben Franklin, and he's old at this point. He's an old dude. Um, he gets lots of money. He gets lots of help. And again, uh, make sure you understand that, that France is sending more than just money. They're sending troops, they're sending materials, they're sending munitions. They send the Marquis de Lafayette, who also is very good at helping uh, secure um, um, aid from France. And again, this is slowly the turning point. And we, as a young nation on page six, begin our first alliance. And this is called the Franco-American Alliance of 1778. France offers the United States a treaty of alliance. This is more, this is, this is going to be the beginnings of the United States not understanding how to deal with foreign countries. They are really good at this. They've been doing it a long time. Us, not so much. And all we see is, oh, we got this great alliance for France. What that alliance means is... We got to help France anytime they need help. We've now become um, attached to France. France understands that. We so much don't understand it. And it's kind of going to kick us in the butt in a couple of um, uh, years when France has their revolution and they want our help for that. So promised Americans recognition of independence. That's the first line we read. Full stop. We're done. Great. Let's sign it. Where do we sign? They don't really look at the rest of this part. Again, both sides bound themselves to wage war until the U.S. wins. Many Americans, many lots say, oh, don't really want this treaty. Don't really want to do this. And the reason why is 3A, strong Roman Catholic country and a traditional um, um, enemy of Britain. They're like, what are we getting into? I don't know. This is a good thing, but we need what they have. So we reluctantly, without a lot of thought, sign this uh, Franco-American alliance. And then the American revolution turns into a world war. And again, that's the part that uh, for the most part um, is left out of our U.S. history that Britain is not just fighting in the colonies because we would have never won that war. We would have never won the war with just Britain fighting the colonies. We had to have Britain fighting everyone else so that we are second place in their fight. And that's what happens. Spain, Holland, France, Russia, 
everybody seizes on this moment and says, this is the time to bring Britain down. And um, all of these people are lining up, uh, lined up all the most remaining European neutrals in an attitude of passive hostility to England. So while they're not waging open war, hostile, they're making everything difficult. War rages in Europe, North America, South America, the Caribbean, Asia, everywhere. There's war everywhere. And everyone is focused on bringing Britain down to our help. Without that, certainly a different story. So back to the war, land, frontier, and sea frontier. So we're going to move to do two different places. The West raged throughout most of the war. And again, um, American Indians are attacking um, colonists. So they're still fighting with the British and colonists hadn't treated them very well after the French and Indian War, which is coming back to kick us in the buttocks, that whole Pontiac's Rebellion and the blankets with the smallpox. Indians hadn't forgotten that. And they see a time where, hey, let's get Britain back in control of this stuff because these colonists haven't been abiding by all the things that the British said they should. So what time am I at? 21. Okay. So um, – I have this in our notes just because of where we are in our George Rogers Clark seizes British ports. Uh, most importantly, Vincennes, Indiana. We don't get to see that very often in real writing. So uh, help quiet the Indian movement. Now, if you're a George Rogers Clark supporter and you're from Indiana, you see this as one of the most important things that happens in the West because now the colonists don't have to worry about the West because British are eventually and Indians are eventually kicked out. Lots of debate that says, and eh, that's not that important. We're going to chalk it up as really important. Then we're going to move to the Navy. Britain has and will and did control the seas. We don't have a Navy. We have merchant ships. We have um, um, big giant sh uh, ships that move goods across the Atlantic. John Paul Jones will be our first uh, naval leader. He's born in Scotland, uh, Scotland, and he is uh, out to destroy merchant shipping. That's an economic way. When war is waged, we, we, the general population, spend a lot of time looking at the war, obviously through battles and uh, loss of life in those types of casualties. But more importantly is the economic war that are that's waged behind the scenes that are just as devastating or just as important in helping countries win. And that's what John Paul Jones does. He sets out to destroy English, uh, British shipping. And if they can't either A, get their own goods to their troops or B, get goods to places to sell so they can make money, that is just as beneficial to the war effort as anything else. Um, sadly, it's not very effective because we don't really have a Navy. John Paul Jones is seen as the father of the United States Navy, um, and uh, he is an important person. American privateers will be more effective, and that's just private ships that are going about. Um, 600 ships captured, but British captured just as many, if not more. Uh, the, the battle on the seas in the American Revolution um, really doesn't do a lot to either cause. We have major battles, though, between Britain and everybody else that has a navy, the British, the French. And these are going to be mostly in the West Indies, trying to control those West Indies in that trade. British will be over overcome by the French, the Spanish, and the Dutch. Um, and eventually, Britain will win that war as well. This is one of those moments at the bottom of page 7 when the Britain changes its strategy. Why? New people come in. They think they've got a better understanding. And then they switch down to the south. And the South had, for the most part, for these first um, two years, really had not participated in any type of um, battles. But they shifted it to the Southern colonies. Again, the point being is trying, they, they, the, the real strategy was they felt like they wouldn't get a lot of resistance in the South and they could get a toehold and start to move. The problem for the British at this point is they really couldn't get inland, right? They couldn't get past New York City. They couldn't get past Boston. And they really needed to get inland so they could swoop around and uh, uh, surround some of these major strongholds of the patriots. And so they figured they could do it in the southern colonies where the resistance wasn't as strong. Problem is they forgot about waving that flag, that freedom flag to slaves. And that's what makes 
the colonies, the southern colonies mad. So they are going to get Savannah. They get that deep water port, just like they got Boston, just like they got New York City. But past that is the problem for the Brits. Um, they'll get Charleston, they'll get Savannah, and it is devastating to lose those big water ports. Nathaniel Green uh, succeeded in clearing Georgia and South Carolina, so they're pushing them that way. And what happens is everybody just gets pushed up into Virginia and Yorktown, and that's where we meet at the bottom of page seven, the Battle of Yorktown, last major battle of the war. It is not the last battle. There will be war that will rage on after, but we consider Yorktown the end because that's when Cornwallis surrenders his army. So Battle of Yorktown, French uh, Admiral brings his fleet up from the Caribbean. Washington comes in to, uh, from the west into Yorktown and in essence surrounds Cornwallis and his troops. Uh, Washington made the 300 plus mile trek from Chesapeake from New York to Chesapeake, 300 miles he moves his army. That is a dedicated army, dedicated to General Washington. And that's the important, they are dedicated to General Washington. October 19th, 1781, Cornwallis surrenders his entire force of 7,000 men. The war is gonna continue for a year, Again, that's usually the story we don't hear. We usually hear Yorktown, yay, it's over, but a whole another year we battle. But this is the most important part of the year of the battles that end is Yorktown. I don't even know what I just said. That made no sense. This uh, battle of Yorktown and the year long towards the end of the war, Yorktown's the most important. And the rest of that time is really just skirmishes that kind of sweep up and end up everything. So, now we get to the interesting part of this American Revolution is how it ends. And this is something we're not very good at. We are not good at the treaties and making peace with other countries who are really good at it. We not so much. So we head over to that ever popular treaty making place, Paris, to make peace. British ready to come to terms. All right, we're done. Let's come to terms. We need to cut our losses. We, we lost in India. We lost in the West Indies. We're losing the Mediterranean. Um, we, George III, is going bat crap crazy. We need to end. And so the French get involved in the Paris. And what the French want, please, 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 make a giant box on eight. France attempts to create a weak United States. Why? So they can swoop in and take us people. Again, this is not a normal way that the, that rebellion happens, that the rebellious people win and they form a country. What normally happens is perhaps the rebellious people win for a while, but a bigger, more powerful country comes in and takes them over. That's what France sees as their role. France sees we're going to keep these people. They don't know what they're doing. We are going to keep them weak. And when they're not looking, we'll sweep in and take over. That's their goal. So we have Ben Franklin again. Awesome Ben Franklin. John Adams, who will be our second president, and John Jay, who will be our first Chief Justice of the United States, go to make uh, a peace treaty. Um, and then they're told, hey, don't make any treaties, don't make any peace, unless you ask the French, because they're our friends. They're not our friends. They ignore the orders because they, especially Ben Franklin, who had been living in the French court and understood all of the backdoor alliances and the way that the French government operated said, I don't know that I trust these people. I'm going to make sure um, that we um, uh, do what's in the best interest of, uh, of our new country. So they ignore these orders. They are very suspicious of France and Spain as they should have been. John Jay believed France wanted to keep the U.S. border east of the Allegheny Mountains and give Western territories to its ally, Spain. That's what they thought. So here's the weird part. We turn to Great Britain. We who just went to war with Great Britain, who are trying to make a peace treaty with Great Britain, ask Great Britain for help in making the peace treaty against them. 
That's how inept we are at this. We know we are out of our league. These people have too much history of making alliances and fighting against each other and then shaking hands the next day. We are out of our league. And when we look at the Treaty of Paris, you will see that we were way out of our league. So the Treaty of Paris, the most important part of the Treaty of Paris of 1783, and remember, we're going to have lots of treaties of Paris, so remember the date, 1783, is Britain formally recognizes our independence. That's the most crucial thing to get out of this whole activity, is we need Great Britain to recognize that we are no longer their colony. We are independent and separate and a new nation, and that is the fundamental um, important part of this uh, peace treaty. Then what do we get? Huge boundaries extending, stretching the Mississippi to the West. We get the Great Lakes, we get Florida, um, and 1B, British troops promise not to take slaves. Don't take our slaves. That's all we get. That's it. Not much. Britain is still in North America, as we're going to see when we fight another war in 1812, not too far after this. But look at what we have to give up. Concessions means what do we give up? Loyalists can't be persecuted, so we cannot persecute them as traitors, as treasonous. We can't do anything to those, those loyalists. Congress was to recommend that state legisl legislators give them back their property. All that property we took, we should give it back. Okay. American states were bound to pay back British debt. Okay, really? Because we won and you want us to pay our debts back to you. That doesn't happen. Shouldn't happen, but it does. U.S. isn't going to comply with these mostly because we can't. We can't pay it back because we don't have the money. France approved the British uh, American terms um, and America alone gained from the war. British lost colonies and territories. France becomes bankrupt. Spain gains little. So that is the end. On page, oh, I'm at 30 minutes. On page nine, we're going to quickly go through American society during the war, just because this is important. Uh, uh, well, over 250,000 Americans fought, which is a lot. 10% um, died, largest percent of any American war in history. We lose more men per capita in the American Revolution than any other war. Um, which I think is significant and important to remember. We always think of like World War II losing so many men, but per capita, we really didn't lose as many as we did in, in certainly other wars. Great Britain occupies almost all of our cities. They get Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Charleston, um, Savannah. They get all those. Now, it's important to note that all of those cities are port cities, and they don't really move inland um, anywhere, but they do get and keep those major cities. All society becomes involved in war. States, um, uh, national governments created men with military experience, volunteered, merchants loaned money. Uh, most of the fighting obviously was done by the poorest of Americans. That's true in all of our wars, every single one of our wars, almost all of it's fight, fought by uh, the poorest of Americans. Young city laborers, farm boys, farm boys, indentured servants, slaves, African Americans are going to fight on both sides. And, um, Native Americans also fought with the British. Women, again, what happens often in times of war, women take up the slack back home. So they keep the farms, they have to manage the businesses, um, uh, and uh, etc. So we're done. We win. We've won. Treaty of Paris might not look so much like we won, but we've been successful and we have um, won and uh, we'll continue to try to make a new country out of nothing. And we will be successful in some areas, not so successful in others. All right. So tomorrow we will um, be playing our review game. Make sure you bring your Chromebook because we do have some things that we have to do on Chromebook. Oh, my phone is ringing. Um, so listen, the um, review game is like an escape room. We're playing it like the operation game. You're getting, um, Good grief. We're getting like the funny bone and the bread basket and you have to capture all of these things in order to save the revolution. So please make sure your um, MacBooks or not MacBooks. I'm sorry. Your Chromebooks are charged. Um, I didn't get that anybody was concerned about uh, 
doing this in small groups. You'll be in groups of four. Some of you will have just a group of three. So it's not large groups. And I've got you spread out around the room and next door too. All right. So um, let me know if you have any questions. This one's really long, but um, I think we're good. All right. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a great Wednesday. Be careful, be safe, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye.